So, um, we call this, um, we were looking at the fiber arrangements in the muscles and the two broad uh, classification are the parallel and the peniform or penate arrangement also known as peniform arrangements. And um, these you know when we say fibers at this sort of macroscopic level when we are talking about the muscle they are actually called fascicles. Okay. We will see why when we look at the structure of the muscle uh, uh, fiber because we will go into the fascicles then into um, that etcetera. So, but we when you are talking about the arrangements and we say muscle fibers we know what uh, what it means. Okay. We are talking about. Uh, so, if you look at the tendon, so the muscle fiber is what is between one tendon and the other. Okay. And it is that configuration that we talk about in this parallel arrangement or the penate arrangement. So, if you look at the parallel arrangement as we saw here, this would be your tendon, okay. you have the tendon and then you have, so you see here actually you see the white tendon here. right? So, those are the tendons and then between those you have the muscle fibers running parallelly. Okay. So, this is the parallel arrangement you have tendon at either end and between them the muscle fibers are uh, parallel. Now, the penny form or the feather like arrangement <coughs> is uh, you know we talk, uh, I said there are three you can have a unipennate arrangement where essentially you may have a tendon like this, a tendon like this, oops, I should turn off the touch on this. Okay. And then the muscle fibers the muscle fibers actually run at an angle between the two tendons to the direction of pull. So, the tendon will be pulling on you know whatever it is the bone that it is pulling on it will be attached to the bone here okay, and here. Okay. So, the tendon is pulling like that, but the muscle fibers are at an angle to the tendon. So, the unipennate would be something like this. So, that is, so it may not be very evident in this figure you see here the both the uh, fusiform and the unipennate look more or less the same but this is what is happening with the unipennate. So, when the muscle fibers contract these two they are contracting in this direction, okay. but the force that is being applied to the bone is at an angle to that. Okay. So, it is not the full, uh, so th these muscle fibers are generally shorter, but you can pack a lot more muscle fibers in that muscle. Okay. And so, there the amount of force that they can generate is much higher. So, in the case of the parallel um, um, arrangement you get a lot of contraction, you get a lot of displacement. Okay. With the uh, peniform arrangement you do not get as much displacement, but you can get larger forces although it is only a portion of the force that is being applied along the tendon it is still larger forces are possible, because you are trying to sort of the body is trying to maximize you know depending on the configuration maximize the area for that particular uh, muscle. Yes. Part of bone or they are separate? They are separate, they are a connective tissue. So, their composition they are not part of bone, they are what connect the muscle to the bone. So, their composition is different from the muscle composition bone composition is different, tendons are different, ligaments are close to tendons, but they are still different. So, if you look at their chemical composition everything will be even the structures will be slightly different. Tendons do they have flexibility? 
Yes, they do have flexibility because they move around joints, okay. They can bend, they are like flexible members, okay. They uh, and they are also elastic to some extent, not as much as muscle, but they can undergo slight strains. We will we'll talk about tendons a little bit more uh, uh, as we move along, but yes, they are uh, elastic, they are non linear, so they actually function more like non linear springs in the body, okay. Your muscles are your actuators, similar to your um, not exactly motors, but more like hydraulic actuators, okay, but they can only um, contract, okay, and apply tension, okay. So, this is the unipennate. The bipennate, similarly, you can uh, probably look up some examples like the uh, rectus femoris, but they may have, so these tendons may have like a central, the tendon may have like a central thing from which you have and then you have the other tendon perhaps and the muscle fibers between them could be like this. Okay, something like that, that would be like a feather and you have the tendon on either side. So, the tendon may be something like this, ten like this. Okay, so that is your bipennate, multipennate muscles, more than more branches than this, you know if this tendon instead of just one central, um, it has multiple ones, then you have like a multipennate muscle fiber arrangement, okay. So, you can see here, yeah. this is a, um, you can see the black parts are the tendon, it shows here, um, I, I presume that is what the uh, person who has drawn this is trying to say here also, but essentially you look at a muscle fiber, it has to connect from one tendon to another. Okay, that is the way you identify the arrangement. You see how it is connected to the other tendon. So, this is your and here if you look at it, you can see that if this is the direction of pull, okay, then this, this blue thing is your anatomical cross sectional area, okay, but it is not really So, if you take a slice, of the muscle perpendicular to the direction of um, pull, then that is your anatomical um, cross sectional area. I should actually draw this the other way, because No, the muscle is subject to, the muscle exerts tension, so this is going to be pulled this way, right, the force on the muscle is. Now, the green, if you take a cross section perpendicular to the fibers, that is really the measure of the force production of the muscle, muscle okay. So, the green thing is what is your P C S A, this is your physiological cross sectional area, okay. So, in a multipennet muscle, the sum of all these areas gives you a measure of the total force that muscle can produce whether that is that is all that force may will not be along the line of action of your uh, tendon. But, but you can also see in the peniform muscles, the fiber lengths are shorter than the tendon 
uh, or or what is known as the whole muscle length okay so they are shorter than the uh, muscle length so in the peniform you have fiber length less than the muscle length Now, this is defined as the physiological cross section area. I'll give you the del. Yes. Fiber is something that makes uh, the muscles, right? Yeah. So, if fiber is constituting the muscles, then it should be equivalent to muscle length. Right? So, we will we'll look at how the muscle is, what the muscle structure is. Okay. So, when we say muscle length, it is from the end to where the tendon, you know from end of one tendon to this, that is your muscle length. So, this to this is my muscle length, okay. that the distance between that is my muscle length, but you can see that the fiber length is less than the muscle length in the penny in the parallel muscle in the parallel arrangement they are more or less equal okay they are uh, the muscle length is equal to the fiber length in most cases uh, here the fiber length is generally less than the muscle length so with the peniform arrangement In the peniform arrangement, you can see that the force, the muscle force, let us call it F m, okay, is this, and the force that is transmitted to the tendon is F t because this is at an angle theta, the theta is called the penation angle and the force that is transmitted to the tendon equals that times cos theta. Okay. So, the definition of PCSA is the sum total of all the cross sections of the fibers in the plane sorry perpendicular to the fiber direction So, because the fiber length is smaller than the muscle length, the you have smaller range of movement but larger force production in the penate type of arrangement. Okay. 
ok. So, now we will look at, so this is like I said, we first started off with ok, muscles are in compartments, then an individual muscle, I say ok, I can see fibers you know in the muscle, I can look at that arrangement. Now, let us go in a bit into the structure of the muscle. So, if you look at the muscle, it is covered by, so it has these fascicles, right. Each muscle may have so, these fascicles are like fiber bundles, ok. Fascicles are so each muscle will have hundreds to thousands of these fiber bundles, lots of bundles in one muscle ok. And then the fascicle itself will have hundreds of fibers, will have several fibers inside. A so, it is like tubes within tubes within tubes, bundles within bundles within bundles, ok. So, you have let me tell you. Um, so, the outer fibrous layer this is called the epimesium and this is what transfers the ten, uh, tension to the tendon. Okay. So, this epimesium co contains all the bundles, fascicles. Okay. Then you look at, so you have several of thousands of these fascicles inside the epimesium. Then each fascicle may have muscle fibers ok. So, if you take a fascicle that also has a few may be up to 200 muscle fibers a few hundred of them muscle fibers. And each fascicle is covered by the perimesia. So, you have the bunch of fascicles covered by the epimesium, then each fascicle covered by a perimesium. So, these coverings are important, the perimesium you know that is where a lot of the blood vessels, the nerves go in to the muscle. So, these are like the junctions, these, these tissues that are covering these fibers that is they provide the pathways for the blood vessels, for the nerves signals etcetera to reach the uh, contractile element of the muscle. And all of these are also provide, they also provide elasticity to the muscle ok. So, that is the role of the perimesium and the epimesium. Then, so the fibers if you look at it they are covered by the endomesium. Again which carry more of the capillaries, the smaller blood vessels and the nerves to innervate the uh, muscle. So, these are also very cylindrical and they are thread like ok and they are 
fairly long also like they are uh, depends, but they could be 15 to 30 centimeter long and they are kind of uh, and they generate the force. So, in the muscle fiber you have thread like structures called the myofibrils. Okay. Okay. So, the myofibrils make up the fiber about 80 percent of the fiber is made up of these myofibrils. Okay. And if you look closely at a myofibril, then you see the structure that is responsible for the contraction of the muscle. So, you have what are known as filaments in this myofiber. So, you have some thick filaments. So, I will okay. this you have these, these are thin filaments called, let me erase this, you have some thick filaments and thin filaments. Now, these can kind of move relative to each other. Okay. So, this the thick filament is called the myosin, that is your myosin, and the thin filament is called the actin. Okay. So, you have the actin and the myosin. Okay. So, we started off we started off at the level of compartments And then we came to compartments are groups of muscles, muscles are groups of fascicles, okay. fascicles are groups of fibers, fibers are groups of myofibrils. and myofibrils have these filaments. Okay. So, these are like a series of stacked together these filaments. So, one filament is like what I showed you here, this is one filament and they are kind of stacked like that. So, this is the structure that of the muscles. So, one unit filaments, one unit is one unit of myosin plus actin is called the sarcomere. So, that is considered the fundamental unit for the muscle.
So myofibrils is the this filament structure bunch of the sarcomeres okay the individual unit in the myofibril is a sarcomere yeah so longer a muscle you have more of these sarcomeres stacked and so uh, we uh, you you can probably guess what happens in the contraction right it's like a sliding uh, action that takes place it's called the sliding filament uh, theory so when you have more of these start right you get more that's um, shortening and that's why the longer fibers can contract more than the shorter ones in the peniform arrangement okay okay so so this is a better picture of the myosin and actin filaments i won't go into the chemistry of it or how it does uh, the chemical action that causes it but essentially what it does is when there is a stimulation okay these the myosin filaments have like these heads okay if you look closely at the myosin filaments they have these flexible heads and they basically act as hooks onto the so the heads have a flexible region they hook onto the actin filament form like a cross bridge that's what it's called and then pull it and then relax again and do that again okay so when they are activated it hooks on pulls it like a rowing action it does this then back then again another site it latches on to and pulls so this stays where it is it pulls the actin filaments closer together to close this gap this h zone that you have that's the gap that can be closed by this action that's cause that's what is causing the that's what is your contraction contraction is basically closing of that gap so in the contracted state the actin filaments basically move closer to together okay so <clears throat> this is called the sliding filament theory this is the most commonly used explanation for muscle contraction it was proposed by huxley and so the thin actin elements so the projections let me just hold i'll just use a new page mm. projections on the myosin form cross bridges with the actin and during contraction the thin elements slide towards each other Oops. 
So, in the contracted state, filaments kind of overlap. And the amount of force developed is proportional to the number of cross bridges that are formed. So, even when a muscle is not moving right like when it is not if it is when we say if it is contracting it means the cross bridges are holding on to one another ok. There may not be movement between the two like uh, and we will talk about the different types of muscle action later. Uh, we call the isometric action right when there is no movement like if you are standing still and nothing is really moving, but your muscles are contracting or I could contract my muscles without causing movement ok. That is called an isometric contraction where there is no movement. So, my muscles are acting muscles are contracting and the force that is produced is even though there is no movement the cross bridges are being formed and that is what is resisting that is what is producing the tension in the muscle. So, when, when a muscle is given is given a stimulus. So, it will contract and then relax this is called a twitch ok. For it to develop force these twitches happen. So, one twitch it, it, it has to build one upon the other ok and then so for instance it will go like this. So, a bunch of twitches together form a somewhat steady force, but when it finally reaches that steady force production ok that is called tetanus. So, when the twitches build upon one another to maintain that force then the muscle is said to uh, be contracting tetanically. So, this limit is called the tetanus and the muscle is set, set to be contracting tetanically ok. So, the nerves have to send this signals and they have to kind of build upon one another to reach this um, steady limit. Here it is called an unfused tetanus. So, these are terms you will come across um, you know muscle tetan tetanic muscle contraction. So, you will know what it means you know when the signals when the frequency of the signals is such that it reaches that 
um, steady force production that is your tetanus. Because this initially in it, in it which this is your contraction period and then that is your relaxation period. Okay. So, this is your relaxation. So, before it fully relaxes you give it another twitch and then that is how it builds up. So, if you look at the length tension relationship for a sarcomere, so at that level, okay, then they have done experiments like this and looked at. Uh, so, if you look at on the x axis you have percentage of the sarcomere length. So, 100 percent means it is at its resting length. Okay. If it is less than that then it is shorter than its resting length. So, if it is at 60 percent it is at a 60 percent of its decreased length that is what the x axis tells you here. Then you look at, so you look at the tetanic force production okay, at these different lengths of the sarcomere. So, if the muscle is and, and the tension is expressed in terms of the maximum tension that can be produced by that sarcomere. So, this here is your 100 percent of the tension that the muscle is capable of producing. You find that it is capable of producing the maximum tension close to its resting length, right. That is where it is capable of producing maximum tension in the muscle. If it is shorter than that, then you can see here okay, the actin elements are kind of overlapped and that interferes with. So, the number of cross bridges are affected by this kind of overlapping of the active actin elements and so the force production falls off steeply. Similarly, if the sarcomere, if the muscle contracts when it is lengthened, okay, so something else is lengthening it and then you apply a signal to contract the muscle, then not enough cross bridges can be formed. So, again the force drops off when it is beyond the resting length. So, under the resting length, beyond the resting length your force production falls off quite dramatically. Close to your resting length is where you have the best force production in the muscle because the cross bridge formation is maximized in that. Uh, in anatomical position that we in the diagram. So, we are now looking at the sarcomere, we are looking at at the microscopic level, but we will come yeah you. At that position then person should feel uh, its muscle should have a high tension in the muscles. If you contract them you can you can contract them. But it is in the natural state we are getting the maximum forces from this curve at 100 percent of length. The maximum a, tension at the in the anatomical position. Okay, That may or may not be the case because if I look at the biceps for a example. I am in the stretched position here, I am not in the resting position for the biceps bracket, right. In the, 
So, it is not necessary that, so the anatomical position that is why it is only like a reference position. Okay, it is a reference position for us engineers to talk about relative positions and movements and to define. Uh, uh, so, it is basically for that, yes. This implies at the resting position I can apply 100 percent of the force. Yes, you can apply if uh, the muscle is capable that is the maximum tension the muscle is capable of uh, uh, supporting. Apply at the muscles resting position. So, you have the sarcomere, okay. it is capable of generating some maximum tension. That maximum tension will happen close to its resting position. It cannot exert, it cannot generate tension greater than that amount. Okay. So, if you change the length, it is only going to go down from there, that is what this means. Okay. So, this is the behavior of the muscle, the contractile element of the muscle alone, the sarcomere. So, when we talk about this length tension relationship here, at the sarcomere level, we are talking about only the contractile component. But you know that there is a lot of connective tissue also involved in this whole structure. So, the whole muscle behavior will also depend on behavior of the surrounding connective tissue as well as the tendons. And the and how the tendons behave. Okay. And I think I will We will talk more about that in the next class because we are almost out of time. Okay.